Welcome to the Plant Trainers Podcast, where we're helping people improve their quality of life through nutrition and fitness. And now, your hosts, nutrition and wellness coaches, international speakers, Adam and Shoshana Chaim. Hey, I'm Adam Chaim. And I'm Shoshana Chaim, and we are Propelled, Propelled by, by plants. plants. Today, we bring to you episode 254, Running Across America and Wilderness Therapy with David Chandler. In today's episode of the Plant Trainers Podcast, we talked to David Chandler about running across America and wilderness therapy. When we first learned about David, we had so many questions. Did he run or walk across America? Did he do it consecutively? Was it self-supported? What's going on with this guy to give him the tenacity to do it? But I hopped on the phone with him, had a quick conversation, and we quickly learned that David had a lot of strength, both in his running abilities and character, and we really wanted to share that with you. From the planning that took place to the logistics around food and accommodation and his hopes to bring attention to wilderness therapy, there were a lot of lessons that we could take away from this episode that can show almost anyone that if you want something badly enough, it is totally possible. David is a plant-based ultramarathoner, and his passions are running, nature, and helping others. For the last three years, he worked as a wilderness therapy guide at Sioux of the Carolinas with kids with mental health and substance abuse struggles. Sioux helps empower kids through the lens of nature, teaches them communication and coping skills as well. As you'll hear, David recently ran 2,900 miles across America. He went from Santa Monica, California to Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina. All of this to raise money for scholarships for low-income students to attend SUS. So far, he's raised $11,000. David continues to run ultra marathons to raise money for this important cause to help these kids that he still works with. The cool thing about Instagram is that it really highlights the quote, a picture is worth a thousand words. We have a great time on Instagram and Instagram stories, bringing plant-based living to life for all of you. There's only so much that you can hear in the episodes that we cover, but we also wanted to help inspire you and give you more tools for everyday living. So whether you're looking at how we're posting our meals, our workouts, our general healthy lifestyle tips, food shops, blogs, or time-saving tips, or the occasional goofy thing that our plant-powered kids did, we put it up there for you. So be sure to follow Plant Trainers on Instagram and say hi and interact with us. We love getting to know you there. And now for a moment of gratitude. Today I'm grateful because we celebrated our cousin's wedding. It was a beautiful wedding, but I've been part of Adam's family for 22 years now. So I knew her since she was eight years old and it was just so wonderful seeing her happy and taking part in what she wanted and being able to bring my children to see her wedding and just enjoy and dance with the family and see our extended family. It was beautiful. So today I'm grateful for the fact that I followed through with what I said I was going to do. And back in January, if you're listening to the podcast, you may remember that I said I was going to train for a 50 mile race. And last weekend was the 50 mile race. And I went out there, I was all set to do it. And I got started. And halfway through, I decided to stop. And I'm not grateful for the fact that I stopped. In fact, I'm a bit disappointed. But what I am grateful for is that I went through all the training, I did all the training, I followed through with what I said I was going to do, but during that race, I just didn't feel good about it, and I felt an old injury coming back, and I had the awareness to pull myself back and stop myself from pushing through and injuring myself long term. So I'm grateful for the fact that I didn't let my ego take over, and uh, not too long ago, I may have let that happen. So A lot of growth here, and I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful you had that growth and that you didn't keep going because I'd be your nurse. (laughs) David Chandler, thank you so much for joining us on the Plant Trainers podcast today. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. We're glad that you're here too, and we wanted to know if you have a moment of gratitude that you'd like to share with us and our listeners. Yeah, just being here on the show um, in the last couple of months, I think I've been really grateful that One of the most important things in my life has been able to help other people and the fact that my running has been something that I've been able to bring to other people and also be able to raise money for a group of people that I care a lot about. 
Well, that's beautiful. Thank you for including being on the Plant Trainers podcast in that. But yeah, it's wonderful how people can find a way to combine something that they love for themselves and something that they feel compassionate about and use the two to help other people. That's great. Absolutely. It's made running even more beautiful of a process for me and in my life. Was running always beautiful for you or was there a time where it was like cleaning the house? It was like a chore. It was definitely like a chore growing up. Uh, I grew up playing competitive soccer and so it was always punishment. And so it was punishment. I didn't want to run. That meant I did something bad or did something wrong. It wasn't until I was 19 or 20, I had stopped playing soccer and stopped running for a long time. Um, And you know what the Spartan race, obstacle race style things are? Yep. So I did one of those and got my butt kicked by it and decided to be competitive at it, which meant I had to start running. And through that process, I ended up falling in love with running more than I did with obstacle racing. That's so interesting that you bring up the idea of using running for punishment, because that's something that we see often in competitive sports, in recreational sports, in gym classes. Throughout. Yeah, it happens all the time in gym classes. You know, you know, no, nobody's paying attention, nobody's listening. All right, we'll run. And I don't know if it's so much a punishment as it is, you know, a way to keep kids busy and blow off some steam so that they could listen to what's coming next because they sit in chairs all day listening. But there is that negative connotation that comes along with it, especially I remember playing basketball and having to do suicides all the time. And I think I said to Adam the other day, I'm like, do they still call them suicides? He's like, yeah, they still call them suicides. And I can't even believe that we're allowed to call it that anymore. (laughs) Running for punishment. (laughs) Running for punishment. So so you were always athletic. Were you always plant-based? Is that how you were raised? Uh, No, not at all. Uh, my parents grew up feeding me pretty healthy food as far as the American diet goes, but I definitely didn't have any consideration. And if I got to choose, it was fast food always. The couple of years before I was vegan in college, I was actually eating almost all fast food, trying to bulk because I was just weightlifting and just trying to add weight because I was just so skinny and small. Um, and then when I started running and trying to be competitive, I was actually traveling all over the U.S trying to win money at those Spartan races um, and realized that diet played an important role actually was paleo first, which is a decent start because I gave up dairy, um, but was eating a ton of meat until I went back to college and cafeteria meat was not real meat and therefore not paleo and I accidentally was vegan for about three months and realized, hey, I feel so much better now that I accidentally haven't eaten meat for three months and just listened to my body and followed it from there. Okay, so I find that really interesting. Can you talk us through the differences that happened in your body, in your recovery, in your energy levels, just by giving up the standard North American diet for the paleo diet? Uh, yeah, just like giving up process, I think, was the best thing I did, even without the plant-based stuff. Just eating real foods, even if it was meat at the time, I felt so much better. I was able to recover. I was doing more workouts and still not feeling as sore as I was when I was just eating all the foods that I wanted at the time. And then slowly just listening to what felt good at the time, I was able to realize that just eating plants and vegetables and fruits and nuts and not eating any of that other stuff, all of the little injuries that always nag you because you run so much they don't always have to nag you a lot of those come from inflammation from the foods that we're eating right so somebody who would have become paleo after you know eating all the crap that they eat all day long and for all those years would feel a positive difference but then when you accidentally became vegan you realized that there was even better things to come that it was even more energizing there was more recovery and I guess, you know, then you start to realize how you're helping the world and and all those other things come later. But for your own personal body and for the sake of being selfish, it was that much better being plant-based than being paleo. Absolutely. Um, When I found plant-based originally was kind of when I switched into doing the ultra marathon type stuff. And I really think that I don't know if I would have been capable of that initial switch on a normal diet, especially because I was only... 20 years old when I did my first ultra marathon, which is pretty young and your metabolism is just so fast that it's hard to keep up. And so I just had to be eating foods that were fueling me. And so how long was that first ultra marathon? Um, My very first 
even marathon was actually the Spartan race ultra marathon. Um, I was one of the faster times and it took me about nine hours. Wow. And so you continued along the ultra marathon track and you got into running across the country. Is that right? (laughs) Yeah, that was. So, uh, so maybe you could tell us how that came about, because that's a pretty long way. Yeah. So several years of doing Spartan races, I wasn't really focused on running. I enjoyed the running part of it more, but didn't realize it at the time. Uh, eventually, a few years after doing Spartan races, I shattered my collarbone um, and just was never able to put the same strength back on and wasn't competitive at Spartan races anymore, uh, which drove me crazy because I'm an extremely competitive person. And so I switched over to doing trail races and ultra marathons and realized that those hours and hours and hours of running and just being alone with yourself and your thoughts was so meditative and healing to me. And I enjoyed it more than the just almost testosterone driven world of obstacle racing of competitive drive and always being better. You can just be alone with yourself and your thoughts out there on the trail. And so several years of just doing ultras, uh, I got a job that I was doing for seven months as a tour guide and was always going to end in California. And I live in North Carolina. So I had the bright idea of, huh, I don't even have to buy a plane ticket. Maybe I should just run home. And so because I had a job that was going to end in California, I decided to just run back home to North Carolina. Dude, that sounds like Adam. <laughs> no, but that's not <laughs> a normal thought. We're driving to Florida. Why don't you pick me up yeah. in West Virginia? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. that's not normal thought process, but it, it's something that... You know, I've said that jokingly a few times, kind of jokingly. Yeah, but, behind every joke. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's that's a long way. So tell us yeah. what what was the distance that you would that you covered, and talk us through the experience. How did it go? Um, well, something along the lines of it not being a normal thought. I actually said it jokingly a few times until one of the staff that I was working with was just like, "Why not? Why don't you do that?" I think that was the first time that I like started to actually think of it as, huh, I guess she's right. This is something I could actually do and not just say. <laughs> it's not something that most people do. You hear about people racing across America by bike, and there have been a few people, I think, that have run across the country, but it's definitely not the norm. Yeah, um, there's a lot more people that have walked across the country than I had realized. I found a really awesome community that got me out of a few pickles when I got stuck a few times with some mapping issues or some stroller issues and definitely had a few people help me out along the way that I had done it before. Okay. What, what, what do you mean? (laughs) So (laughs) I showed Adam your Instagram and he's like, why are you showing me a picture of a stroller? And, (laughs) and I'm like, because that's basically your home. So why don't you explain to us that, I, I mean, we, we, we talked a little bit about this before, how you didn't have a, a support crew. You didn't have a hotel at every stop. You didn't sleep yeah. a full night every night. So walk us through what it actually looked like when you woke up on that first day and said, okay, here I go. What supplies did you have with you and who was with you? So I actually started in at the Santa Monica Pier completely on my own. I had to walk up to a complete stranger to get them to take a picture of me with my feet in the ocean. So it was a little bit weird and anticlimactic, just starting something that big completely on my own with no one on the beach knowing what I was doing that day, which was it kind of indicative of how the rest of the process was going to go, just people driving by all day having no idea what I'm going through or what I'm in. Um, but it was just me and my baby stroller full of food for however many days it was going to be until I was at a place that I could do some grocery shopping um, and camping gear, camping stove, everything I needed to live in camp was tucked away into a baby stroller. And I was pushing that all day, every day, my little home on wheels. Every day for how long? Uh, It took me 91 days. 91 days to cover from the ocean on the California coast all the way back to North Carolina? Mm-hmm. 2,900 miles. 2,900 miles. So how many miles per day do you think you were covering? The average is about 33 miles a day. Um, but with rest days and a few other things with starting slow and stuff, those last two months, I was, if I was doing a moving day, it was over 40 miles at least normally. That's a lot of miles. Yeah, yeah, it was 
all day, every day, just forward progress. <laughs> and then when you were tired, you would just stop on the side of the road and take a nap. Uh, I actually only did that the one time, um, and it didn't work out well for me. Um, yeah, tell us about that. North, <laughs> so by the time I hit North Carolina, I was completely fried. I was 2,500 miles in, and I hadn't gotten a full rest day. My last rest day was the Saturday after Thanksgiving, and then I finished Christmas Eve without taking a rest day because snowstorms kept pushing me back, and I had made the goal to finish before Christmas. And so I just didn't get a rest day, and I was so tired, so exhausted. Everything was hurting. And so my feet got to the point that I had to take a nap. Um, it was only about three days from the finish, but I had to take a nap. And so I took my shoes off to let my feet try and reduce swelling so that I could keep running and lay down on the side of the road with uh, just my pack because someone was crewing me that day since I was close to the finish. My family was there, and so I used my pack as a pillow sleeping on the side of the road, a few cars honked their horns, and I just tried to ignore them and keep sleeping. And then I heard a little whoop whoop behind me, picked my head up, and a police officer came up. And when I lifted up and looked at him, he just started laughing at me. Apparently someone had called in uh, a dead body on the side of the road. Oh, man. And then what was your reaction? Did you have, what, was it just a big joke or did you have any deeper thinking of, oh my God, that, you know, that could be true? <laughs> oh, it was definitely laughing. I think okay. I was so stripped of everything that everything was just complete raw emotions at that point. And just laughing at the metaphor of, yes, I essentially am a dead body on the side <laughs> of the road, but I am still alive. <laughs> Okay, so you decided that you needed to get home. You were going to do it by foot, walking, running, whatever it is, averaging 30 miles a day. There had to be some deeper purpose to you doing this. So what was the underlying reason that you decided to take this journey? Um, or was it just simple and you just wanted to do it because you thought it was cool? I think that the easy answer would be to say that it was just kind of cool and it was just something that I wanted to do. Um, and I don't think that I realized why I thought it was cool. I definitely think that I have lost touch with who I was as a person um, and just needed to do something drastic in order to get that time alone with myself and think and just have that time. I think we're so surrounded by all of this stimulus all the time that we don't have time to ourselves anymore. And having that time to myself was, one of the hardest parts, loneliness was one of the hardest parts of that run and just overcoming that and, or well, trying to overcome it for the first couple of months until one of my friends talked to me about it and was like, just own it. You're lonely and that's okay. And as soon as I started to do that, I was like, yeah, this is awesome. I'm okay by myself. So you by yourself, I want to go back to the, to the baby stroller again. So you, yeah. you had food for the week yeah. or for a few days until you were able to find food again. Were there... Where, did you veer off the highway much? Were there good grocery stores? How did you get the food? How did you know what you were going to have available to you to be able to fuel yourself to get to the other side? Uh, well, I went into it knowing that I wasn't going to have good grocery stores. I wasn't going to have Whole Foods or any other grocery stores that were really great because I was sticking to state highways. Um, so I was back in super small towns to what I was always referring to as Dollar General towns. The Dollar General was the grocery store in most of these small towns that I was going through. There wasn't any form of a real grocery store, just the Dollar General with a tiny produce section. And so I had planned according to that. And I was eating snack bars for breakfast and throughout the day, peanut butter tortillas for lunch, nuts, any high fat things I could do just because calories. And when I'm doing long distance things, I do prefer high fat things so that it's a long lasting, long burning calorie. But I was getting uh, freeze dried meals shipped to me throughout the way for dinner because I realized that dinners were going to be something that were going to be just super hard to find something healthy or worthwhile to put into your body at a Dollar General. And every mile that I have to walk out of the way to go to a better grocery store is one mile back, which just would have added up drastically throughout a three month journey. So I was just getting going online and shopping and had other people kind enough to 
go online and get them shipped to me as well. A lot of my dinners, most of the second half of my journey, my dinners were being shipped to me by people that were just wanting to help me out in any way they could. And how did they know about what you were doing? Uh, social media, I was posting on my Instagram and Facebook every day, as well as just the running community um, really supports each other. I posted on a few places and ended up having some places to stay from some Facebook groups that were just trail running groups that I had never seen before. Posted my route and a few people reached out and said they wanted to help me and give me a place to stay so that I wasn't sleeping in the dirt for one night. Did you ever wake up one morning and say, you know what, I'm just not going to finish. I'm just not going to do this anymore. I've had enough. You know, it hurts me here. It hurts me there. Time to just call a cab for the next leg or jump on a plane. Anything like that come up? Uh, oh, frequently, but normally it was in the middle of nowhere when you have those thoughts. And it's just like, well, even if I quit right now, I still have to run another 50 miles to get to a place where I can quit. So normally by the time I made it there, it's like, all right, got to keep going. <laughs> We're taking a short break to let you know that this episode of the Plant Trainers Podcast is brought to you by Four Sigmatic Foods. We were first introduced to Four Sigmatic Foods while I was browsing a natural food store looking for a coffee-like substance that would provide some energy and some health benefits. And as I was Looking around, I was drawn to this mushroom coffee mix. It contained cordyceps and chaga mushrooms, and at the time, I was already using cordyceps in my daily routine, and just mixing it with the coffee, it seemed like a perfect match. This combination really got me going in the morning. Whether I was getting ready for a short run or a long run, it didn't matter. The best part is that when you use this mix, you don't even need a coffee machine. And so no matter where you train, you just need a mug and some hot water in a packet and you're good to go. The quality is amazing. The chaga mushrooms help support daily immune functions and the cordyceps have incredible antioxidant properties. They provide energy, stamina, and help to improve athletic performance. They use 100% organically grown Arabica beans in every packet, and it's all third-party tested. And now, best of all, they have these pods. So if you do have a Keurig, you now can have this mushroom mix coffee in your Keurig, which is pretty awesome. So if you want to get a head start on your training day, go to foursigmatic.com slash plant trainers. That's F-O-U-R-S-I-G-M-A-T-I-C.com slash plant trainers. Search for the item that calls to you the most and be sure to put in the discount code plant trainers, all one word lowercase, to get 15% off your order at checkout. And now back to the show. Your poor mother, she, her blood uh, pressure must have skyrocketed. Oh, man, for months I told her it was going to happen, and she refused to. Anytime I tried to talk about it, she's like, no, we're not talking about it. We are not talking about it. Uh, <laughs> you had a then, cell phone, though, right? Yeah, yeah she came and visited posting. California oh, right. about a week I started. She was like, all right, tell me what you're doing, how it's going to happen. And once I explained to her that I had a plan, she was on my side, and her and my dad were two of my biggest supporters. I spoke to them on the phone more than I ever have in my life because – I needed someone to talk to or distract me or I got stuck in a few bad situations and they helped me get me out of it when I didn't have enough service to Google things, but they did. I got like, I ran 32 miles on Saturday and I can't, oh, yeah. I can't imagine doing that again on Sunday and then doing that again on yeah. Monday and then doing it again on Tuesday. And then, you know, like that seems like a yeah. lot, a lot, yeah. a lot. Like, I think it would be super cool to run across Canada, which is crazy, yeah. but yeah. like, I would have to take a year off to do it. Like, I don't know how. You have to take a year off work and a year off marriage. A year family. off. Yeah, no, I have to take a year off my whole life yeah. to be able to do something like that. Like, that's, that's intense. That's insane. Like, yeah. I was on the phone with my mom one day. And I was like 30 miles in and I knew that I had to stop at the next town. That was only about three miles ahead, but I had planned on running in about 45 that day, but I was just too tired to go past 33 miles. Um, and I was talking to her and I was super mad at myself. And I was like, yeah, I'm only doing 33 miles today. Just like, ah, I'm just so mad at myself. And she's like, David, you did 33 miles today. That's not normal. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> yeah, you don't start at the 35 and work backwards. You start at zero, right? Yeah, 
Yeah, the, for that first week, I didn't run over a marathon the whole first week. It's amazing. So getting back to being mistaken by a dead body, did was there any time where you needed medical attention? Needed medical attention, not really. I definitely had a lot of aches and pains. The only real uh, problem I had was my right knee hurt a few times. Right at the beginning, there was a 115-mile section of wilderness where there was no water, no food, no gas stations. There was nothing going north around Joshua Tree into Arizona. And I pushed a little too hard too soon and was averaging about 40 miles for three days to get through that, Um, which that was in the first two weeks of my journey, and my body just wasn't ready for those miles. So my knee was killing me. I took a rest day, and then... I think it was almost a week. I had to walk all day, every day. I couldn't run at all for almost a week. But I was able to keep walking still 35-ish miles a day at that point. Forward progress all day still gets you there. You can walk a long way as if you walk from sun up to sundown. But I was able to, I had no injuries that prevented me from just walking for a day or taking a rest day, and everything was fine, which surprised the heck out of me and I'm super grateful for do you think you would have been able to do that distance indoors on a treadmill? Oh, absolutely not. I, like to simulate it? No. Indoors so for 2,900 oh. miles? I'm going somewhere with this. I'm leading into oh, the man. nature portion of this. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Oh, I my. have tried doing workouts on treadmills, and I normally can't go more than two miles. I just get so bored. Two miles? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> two miles on a treadmill is a good day for me. Oh, wow. So... I, uh, and there's nowhere for it to go when you're trapped inside well when you live where we do well you live in north carolina you see winter it's it's not that easy to get out there in the middle of winter sometimes and the treadmill comes in very handy so yeah well when you when you came home it was christmas eve right uh by the time i got back to i got back to my parents house to celebrate christmas christmas i guess the night of christmas eve yeah okay so where do your parents live outside of raleigh north carolina so is it still pretty chilly then? Uh, yeah, it was yeah. still, I was running through snow in the mountains of North Carolina and it was a high of like 35 or 40 throughout the last month of my journey. So then you prepped for that in advance and you carried those winter running clothes with you in your stroller the whole time. Yeah, winter running clothes, winter sleeping bag, lots and lots of layers and just different things to try and stay as warm and comfortable as possible. Amazing. What a trip. All right. So now getting into the nature, tell us about your connection with nature and how it helps heal you and the people who you work with. Uh, yeah. So I am a wilderness therapy guy. Uh, so I work for a week at a time and then have a week off. Uh, but I work with kids, 14 to 17 year old going through drug abuse, drug addiction problems. And so I'm out there for literally half of my life right now doing backpacking and teaching them different wilderness skills, uh, how to strike a fire with quartz and steel or how to bow drill a fire, which is uh, making a friction fire with just some sticks that you can find on the ground and just really trying to empower them to be able to take care of themselves and learn how they have all of the power they need to care for themselves, which is definitely something new for teenagers who are going through all of these drug abuse, drug addiction problems and teaching them that they have control of their situations as opposed to their situations controlling them. And nature is just such a beautiful metaphor for all of that. And you can find any metaphor in nature. And that has been true for myself as well. Just getting out on trails and trail running and running to the point of exhaustion and breaking down and seeing how beautiful nature is around me. And also the humbling part of nature can break you down. It can get cold. You can get wet and Every time that you think that you know what you're doing and are in control, even though I've been guiding for years, their nature can definitely fight back and just tell you, you need to be humble. (laughs) And what is your favorite part about nature? What's your favorite weather or place to be? My favorite place to live is actually right where I'm living right now. The southern part of the Appalachian Mountains is definitely my home. It's so beautiful. There's four seasons. It's so green. Where I'm at is actually a temperate rainforest, so it does rain a lot, but because of that, it's so green and there's so much lush plant life and animal life down here. But I think my favorite place to travel and some of my 
favorite memories from my cross country run are the deserts out west. They're so beautiful. There's so much more plant life and animal life than people realize. It's so beautiful and it's just, it's so big, but then the plant and animal life are so small and delicate and fragile in such an extreme environment. How do you make that connection with the youth that you're working with in terms of the delicateness of nature and you know, how all the rain creates the beautiful things. How do you, do you make that kind of connection with them in their own lives as well? I definitely try to create an environment where they can learn that. Cause I think that's something that it's hard to force someone else to realize that lesson. And so you just have to try and create an environment and teach them like the practices of leave no trace and the idea that if we take care of something, it's going to take care of us in return. And that if we're breaking down the things around us, it's also going to break down ourselves as well and so using the metaphors I try and allow them to come to a space where they can see that and realize that on their own but I think that everyone has a different process and you can't be forced into seeing and learning that nature can heal you. And part of the reason why you did this run across of North America is to bring awareness to these programs that that you work with. Uh, Yeah Um, so the program that I work with unfortunately insurance doesn't really recognize that nature is a place that heals people. They think that mental health can only be something that's treated in an indoor program with quote unquote real therapy. And I've worked in that place before and wilderness therapy works so much better. The kids get so much more out of this program every single time without fail. The kids I work with leave with so much more than the indoor treatment places I'd worked at before. But because of that, normally only very well off families that can afford very expensive treatment without very much help from insurance can afford to do it. And so I work with Guys Limit Fund who give scholarships to kids that normally wouldn't get to afford this type of treatment. That's amazing. Thank you so much for that work that you're doing. Uh, I enjoyed it so much. It made it so much more meaningful for me. And totally those moments where I was going to quit, I was like, no, I can't quit. I those kids and all of these people are counting on me. It made it so much easier for me to keep running every single day. So there was a deeper purpose in the end. You just may not have realized it at the beginning. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so when you ended up finishing this big cross country run, how much time did you take off before you started running again? I actually only took one day off and felt terrible. And then ran every day for a week because my body was just used to running and so completely cutting it off I felt awful so I ran a few miles every day for a week and then once my body started getting used to not moving and had switched into a place where it could recover instead of just trying to get up and just move every day I took about a month off without running at all Mm -hmm. I was still relearning lifting and biking and trying to do other things to try and stay loose and regain a lot of flexibility that I lost during that run and strength and weight in general. But I took a month off of running after a little bit of a adjustment period back, trying to get readjusted to living a more normal life. <laughs> so then once you took that time off, you eased back into it, right? You would think, but uh, <laughs> I run a month off. Uh, I signed up my favorite race that happens every year at Nashville. Hmm. Uh, so my first run back was actually a trail marathon that was straight up a mountain and then straight back down. Um, but I rationalized that, hey, it was only 26 miles, and I can take it easy and have fun with it. And that is what I did, and I actually ended up feeling good. I went really slow and just had fun and enjoyed a lot more views than I have been able to get along that race just because I was having fun and not pushing myself so hard. So the youth that you work with now, do you take them on runs? No, unfortunately not. Um, we got to stay within eyeshot of the other group at all times with those kids. Cause a lot of them will try and run or it's not necessarily safe to be one-on-one with those kids outside of eyeshot of the group. So unfortunately not, but we do backpack every day with them. So we backpack from one campsite to the next, which is more physical activity than they frequently want for themselves. <laughs> mm-hmm. So then do you not run while you're working those weeks or do you wake up early and get a run done? I don't really get to run. Um, every once in a while I'll do hill repeat right beside camp, but I can't get very far from camp because as long as I've been there now, I'm normally heading and 
in control of a group and the group safety is in my hands. And that means I need to be there if something happens. And recently you did a different run, didn't you? You ran in the Grand Canyon? Yeah. So one of the great parts of my job is since I work week on, week off. I take one week off. I have three weeks off. So I just took a week off, drove three days out to the Grand Canyon, and was able to run from South Rim to North Rim, back to South Rim, um, 13 and a half hours. It was a long, beautiful, very tiring run. That would be gorgeous. That must be really nice to do. 13 and a half hours. Does the heat yeah. bother you anymore? No, it was, this is the right time of year to do it. It was actually kind of cold. Down in the bottom, it was felt perfect, shorts and t-shirt. But on top of the rims, we had jackets. It was kind of cold. The high was only 65, even at the bottom, I think. So we saw quite a few other runners out there doing it. Cause this is the time of year where the heat doesn't get you, but the snow has melted on top of the north rim so you can actually access it but two three more weeks and that heat will kill you down in the bottom of the canyon if you're not careful Hmm. so what message do you have for people who want to find some kind of deeper meaning or have some kind of experience like you did to learn more about themselves or help other people where should they start i think as far as helping other people i think you always have to start with yourself for me i found something that i loved and eventually was able to find a way that something that was so meaningful for me was able to bleed into helping other people, which I was passionate about. But it all started with me being able to find that thing that I cared enough about to do something big. And I think the way that I got there was using the thing that I loved in order to work on myself. I started meditating while I was running. And so just focusing on breath and trying to really ground myself and be completely present and engaged with every run that I did for a long time and just finding that calm, peaceful center and being able to get back in touch with myself and do something that I love and nature helps in that process. It's so much easier to find yourself and to be alone with yourself and your thoughts when you're in nature. There isn't all the distraction. Even if you're running in the city, there's constant flashing lights and signs and people. So when you're out there on that trail, it's just you and yourself. I think that's such a great message to share with everybody. And the journeys that you've been on so far are pretty incredible. They're amazing stories that you're sharing, and we really appreciate you doing that. If people want to reach out to you and hear more of your story or see what you've been doing or what you're up to next, where would you like them to go? My Instagram is where I post the most, uh, bchan30. And I have a link to my fundraiser. I'm actually continuing to work with that program, and I'm trying to continue to raise money, obviously, not as much as when I was running across the country because that is just such a big feat that it just gets so much more attention. But uh, I was trying to raise money with my run to the Grand Canyon. I'm already trying to plan my next run. I have a few ideas. I might try and run across Zion National Park or across the White Mountains up in New Hampshire and Vermont or maybe a pretty big chunk of Appalachian Trail over a few days. Hmm. Um, but I might continue to try and do these big runs and try and raise awareness and let people know that wilderness therapy works and that there's people that need help to be able to get to a place that they can get that help that they need. Well, again, thank you so much for that work that you're doing to raise awareness for the children and for society as a whole. And I think it's an amazing task that you that you undertook and that you achieved. So good for you on that. And I mean, that's... And that he continues to do. Yeah. You know, he's yeah. still not done. There's more fundraising to do, yeah. more running to do. And we're going to link to everything you mentioned in our show notes at planttrainers.com so people can find you and find your fundraiser and try to contribute. That would be great. Yeah, thank you so much. I really love the message that you guys have and just bringing awareness to plant-based diet and not only that, but lifestyle that goes with it in order to be healthy. I so appreciate y'all's message. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. Thank you, David. Thank you so much for listening to this edition of the Plant Trainers Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or any other podcast listening platforms. We appreciate the feedback we receive from you. Every time we get a five-star rating or review on iTunes from one of our fans, it ensures other people will find us too. Thanks to our patrons. To become a patron, visit www.patreon.com slash plant trainers. Even supporting us with $1 really makes a difference. Connect and follow us on Instagram and Twitter 
Twitter, at Plant Trainers. Like Plant Trainers on Facebook, join our newsletter, and check out our website at www.planttrainers.com for awesome plant-based recipes and a list of our services. Email your questions to info at planttrainers.com so we can answer them on our upcoming Facebook Lives. We hope we've inspired you today. Join us again next time, and have a healthy day.